All right, let's dive into chapter 16 from Night of the Spadefoot Toads. We're getting closer and closer to the end. I wonder what's going to happen. Will he save the Spadefoot Toads? Let's read some more and find out. Did you know that ice fish in the Arctic Ocean have their own antifreeze? If they didn't, they'd be ice cubes. And did you know it gets so cold down there that your skin would freeze in only a minute? Ben tries to look interested, but to tell the truth, he's sick of hearing about Ryan's geography report. The bus stops and a few kids get off. Ryan babbles on about the Antarctic sukuas and the penguins. Ben is wondering how much longer it will take for the bus to reach the school when he hears a low chant coming from the back of the bus. Ben can't make out the words, but he can tell that more kids have joined in. He turns around. Frankie Murley is in the back of the bus, leading the boys in the back seats in a dumb, sing-songy chorus. Captain, kid, and snake, man. Captain, kid, and snake, man. Captain, kid, and snake, man. Ryan has finally heard it, too. Frankie's such a jerk, to, he mutters to Ben. And before Ben can stop him, Ryan stands up in the aisle and shouts, Back in the same sing-song way, Frankie's such a jerk, jerk, Frankie's such a jerk. He yells even louder than Frankie. And the kids in the front of the bus stop talking and turn around. When the bus slows down for the next stop, Frankie makes his way up the aisle and pushes Ryan back into his seat. Say that again, matey, he says, holding one hand over his eye like a patch. Ben's heart pounds. Stop it, he says. Oh, look, Snake Man can talk. Frankie turns around to make sure that the other boys are watching, and he makes a rattling sound with his mouth. Leave Ryan alone, says Ben. You started it with that stupid chant. What'd you say, Cap'n? Do you want me to leave you alone? Ryan tries to yank Ryan's, Frankie tries to yank Ryan's glasses off, but Ben knocks his hand away and the glasses with the patch hang lopsided down Ryan's nose. Ben has had it and without even thinking, he climbs over Ryan and lifts Frankie up by his jacket, pushing him back down the aisle. Hey! The bus driver shouts, enough of that, everyone in your seats. Suddenly, everyone is yelling and hooting, leave him alone, Ben screams, leave my friend alone. Ben's eyes filled with tears, but he doesn't care if anyone sees. He gives Frankie's jacket another shake and shoves him back in the seat. The bus driver pulls the bus to the curb and lurches down the aisle. You boys settle down or you'll be walking to school for the next month. Everyone on the bus is quiet now. Ben drops down to the seat next to Frankie. Sorry, he says to the driver. I'd better not hear another word out of the two of you. The bus driver glares at them and then returns to the front. And as soon as the bus pulls away from the curb, Frankie snorts in disgust. I'm glad I'm moving. This school and all the losers in it, like you, stink big time. You're moving? Ben can't believe what he just heard. You're leaving? When? This summer, Frankie says. I wish it was tomorrow. Who wants to live in this crappy town anyway? Ben tries to hide a smile. Good luck. What do you mean? Frankie said. I mean, good luck being the new kid in a different school. You better hope that wherever you move, the kids there are nicer than you because you can be a real creep. Yeah, 
Ryan is up on his knees looking over the back seat, and I hope the overtoad eats you up. Danny Martin chokes back a laugh. Frankie glowers at him, and Danny whirls around to face the front. At the next bus stop, Ben heads back to his seat. One for the overtoad, he says to Ryan. <laughs> yeah, one for the overtoad. And Ryan gives Ben a huge goofy grin and picks up his book bag. Gotta get off here, but I'll see you tomorrow, he says. We'll have a blast. See you, Ryan. Ben watches out the window as Ryan gets off the bus. And as he heads across the street to his house, Ben is still shaky from his encounter with Frankie, but he grins. He can feel people looking at him, but it doesn't bother him at all. Then he remembers his geography report and his stomach starts to roll over once and then settles into a dull churning. Hey, his father says, standing in the door of Ben's room. Agatha is beside him, already in her pajamas. Hey, Ben says, placing his arm over the notes and the desert pictures that are scattered on his desk. How's the report? Pretty good, Ben says, hoping that that will be enough for his father. His dad plops down on Ben's bed and pulls Agatha onto his lap. Ben cringes. This is not good. Your mom thought that we ought to take a look at it to see if we can help you finish it up. No, that's okay, Ben says. I can do it. Actually, I'd like to see it. It's quiet for a couple of seconds, and Ben points to the papers on his desk. Here it is. Well, these look like notes. Can I see what you've written? I haven't really written much yet, Ben mutters. He fumbles for something else to say, knowing the truth is about to come out. And to make matters worse, his mom sticks her head in the door. Bedtime, she says. Ben showing dad his report, Agatha says, except he doesn't have it. <sighs> ben gives his sister a hard look. Why don't you go jump in a lake, he says. Because I don't want to, Agatha says. You're the one who's, Agatha, enough. Dad lifts her off his lap and puts her on the floor. Have you written anything, Ben? Um, not much. Ben, you told us you were working on it and we trusted you. Haven't you even started writing? Ben shrugs. Uh-oh, Agatha says. Now, Ben's in a bunch of trouble, a bunch of different ways. Shut up, Agatha. Ben wants to strangle his little sister. What do you mean a bunch of ways? His mom asks. Should I tell them? Agatha keeps her eyes on Ben, but he edges closer to her mother. No, Ben says. Okay, 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 says his father. What's happening? Ben got into a fight and almost got thrown off the bus. I did not. Did so? The bus driver says, you're not supposed to fight on the bus, and you did. Agatha, Ben yells. Enough, enough, their father says. Agatha, go with mom. Agatha sticks her tongue out at Ben as Mom drags her out the door. Ben, what is going on with you? There's so much going on in his head, and Ben doesn't even know where to start. Is this about Miss Tibbetts again? His dad asks. Is that why you're not doing your work? No. Actually, it is about Mrs. Tibbetts, but it's also about Frankie and Ryan and the Spadefoots and Mrs. Tibbetts' sister-in-law and the man from the Natural Heritage Program and being new. His father sits on his bed, holding his head in his hands, staring at the floor. Sorry, Dad, Ben says. His father looks up. What are you going to do about your report? It's Wednesday. Isn't it due Friday? 
I'll finish it tomorrow, Ben says. Just make sure you get it done. His father stands and comes over to Ben's chair. Is there anything that I can do to help? Ben shakes his head. I love you, pal, he says. I know, Ben says. Thanks. It's torture getting through class the next morning. Every time Ben thinks about the report, his stomach clenches up. And while Mrs. Kutcher is writing something on the board, Jenny turns around in her seat. I heard about the fight, she whispers. It wasn't a fight, Ben says. It sure sounded like a fight. I noted Mr. Loudmouth has been pretty quiet this morning. Ben looks back toward Frankie's desk. Frankie is staring straight at him, but he jerks his head down the moment Ben meets his gaze. Ben doesn't really care about Frankie. He's got more important things on his mind. The pool in the woods behind Mrs. Tibbetts' house is surely gone by now. And he hopes that Mrs. Tibbetts can convince Mr. Lindsay that there really were spade foots in the pool. And now he needs to concentrate on his report. He can't get more stuff off the internet. And after school, he can go to the town library and he can even ask his mom or dad for help. He could draw a map of the area. Maybe he can pull it off. <sighs> he feels better. He can do it. Ben crams his books and his desert note cards in his backpack. It's almost time for dismissal. Hey, Ben, Jenny says, looking over her shoulder. Yeah? See you this afternoon. What for? You know, Ryan's party. <gasps> what? Today is Ryan's party. I know he invited you. You're coming, right? <gasps> ben remembers the party hat invitation that he stuffed under the papers in his desk, he feels like he might throw up. Is your mom bringing you over? Um, I don't know, Ben stammers. I, I guess so. Okay, then see you there. Jenny disappears into the crowd of kids leaving the classroom. Ryan sits next to Ben on the bus. He's so excited about his party. He's talking faster than usual. Ben smiles like he's listening, but his mind is all over the place trying to figure out what to do. Ben finally interrupts the nonstop chatter. Ryan? Yeah? I can't come today. What? I'm sorry. I can't come to your party. I haven't done my report, and I'm pretty much grounded until I finish it. I'm really sorry. But you said you were coming. You said my mom didn't need to call. I know, and I was coming, and I totally forgot it was today. And if I don't get this report done, I'll be in big trouble. But you've been working on it for weeks. Can't you just finish it after the party? I can't. I've barely even started on it. But my mom has already ordered the pizza and everything. That's okay. There'll be more for everyone else. Come on, Ryan. I said I was sorry. You have plenty of fun without me. Ryan turns his back to Ben and stares out the window. And when the bus pulls up to Ryan's stop, he squeezes past Ben and trudges down the aisle. Ben watches him as he steps onto the sidewalk. And Ryan takes his glasses off and rubs his shirt sleeve across his eyes. He glances back up at the bus window and his lazy eyes looking off to the left like he's watching someone in the street. But the other eye looks straight at Ben, hurt and sad. At his last stop, Ben climbs down from the bus and walks toward the house. Agatha trails along behind him. I know something you don't know, she sings. I know something you don't know. Ben tries to ignore her, but she sings it louder and louder. Finally, Ben turns around to face her. Okay, I give up. What do you know that I don't know? It's about Ryan's party, she says. What? Ryan told me that you 
and Jenny are the only ones that he invited. She says that you're his only real friends. That's not true, Ben says. Yes, it is, she says. It's a secret. I'm going to the library to work on my report, Ben tells his mom. Don't you want a ride? She asks, looking up from her magazine. No, thanks. I'm taking my bike. It's not too far. Okay, she says. Work hard. Ben slips his backpack over his shoulders and climbs on his bike and pedals out of the driveway. Ten minutes later, he pulls up into Ryan's driveway and leaves his bike on the grass. When he knocks on the door, Rory answers it. Ryan! Jenny! She screams. Ryan! Ben's here! Ben hears someone running, and he searches in his backpack, and he pulls out amphibians of the world. Ryan pushes Roy out of the way and swings the door wide open. Happy birthday, Ben says, holding out the book. Ryan's smile is so big, it seems like it's going to fall off of his face. Cool, he says. Cool. This is so cool. Ben peers through the kitchen window. His father is pacing back and forth, something he does when he's excited or upset. His mother is leaning against the counter with her arms folded. Ben takes a deep breath and opens the back door. Is that you, Ben? His mother asks. Yeah, Ben calls, waiting for the ax to fall. Where on earth have you been? I was ready to send your father out looking for you. I've been at Ryan's house. Ryan's house? You said you were going to the library. I know, Ben says. His father says, you lied to your mother. I know, I'm sorry. You were supposed to be working on your report. But I had to go to Ryan's party. I promised him I would. And why didn't we know about this party? His mother asks. I forgot to tell you. His parents look at each other like their son has lost his mind. His father sh shakes his head and then squeezes the bridge of his nose with his fingertips. <sighs> Go work on your report. We'll talk about your punishment tomorrow, his father says. But dad, but nothing. Go to your room and get busy. Now, I don't know where all of this lying is coming from, but it's going to stop. Ben's cheeks are hot. He doesn't blame his parents for being mad, but he was only trying to do the right thing. Dad! Agatha bursts into the kitchen. Ben is about to tell her to get out, but he stops when he sees her face. It's all red and in a pout. She plants herself in the middle of the room, arms folded across the chest. I heard what you said, she says. It's not fair, she says. Ben was just being a friend. That's enough, Agatha, Dad says. This doesn't. Why are you punishing Ben? He messed up by not doing his report sooner. But Ryan doesn't have any friends besides Ben and Jenny. And isn't being a friend more important than finishing a dumb report? Ben stares at his sister, not sure that he heard her right. Ben has to make friends if he's going to live here. All of his other friends are in Tucson, Agatha says. His parents are looking at each other. His father's mouth's all twisted like he's trying not to smile. His mother looks away like she doesn't want anyone to see what she's thinking. Agatha, the twiny little sister, breaks through his parents' barrier. Ben thinks, it's a miracle. Well. His mother clears her throat. Even if it is true, you still have to do your report. You promised you'd get it done tonight. Somehow, in the smallest of ways, twitty little Agatha has given Ben a little breathing space. Okay, he says, and as he walks past his mom and dad, he can feel their eyes on him. And when he passes Agatha, he motions for her to follow. They walk down the hall together, and at the door of his room, Ben turns and looks into his little sister's eyes. Thanks, Agatha, he says. Thanks a lot. 
you saved my butt out there. I know, she says. I'm a good saver. Bring your reports up, please. Wait until I call your row. Mrs. Kutcher stands at the front of the class and watches as students file up and place the reports on the big table under the bulletin board. Thank you, class. I appreciate all your hard work, and I look forward to reading each one. Now, I'd like you to sit silently for a few minutes and read tomorrow's assignment, pages 178 to 190. When everyone is reading quietly, Mrs. Kutcher motions for Ben to come up to her desk. I didn't see you hand in a report, Ben. Did you forget and leave yours at home? I didn't finish, Ben says, keeping his head down. Why not? I gave you the assignment weeks ago. Ben shrugs. I just couldn't get it done. If you needed more time, then why didn't you come to me sooner? Mrs. Kutcher leans over her desks. Well, what are we going to do? Maybe I could do it this weekend? That doesn't sound very convincing. Suddenly, Ryan's at Ben's side. Mrs. Kutcher, he begins. His voice is too loud, like always. Other kids can hear him. It's embarrassing, but it's too late to stop him. Not that that could stop him anyway. Ben wanted to do his paper, but he had to come to my party. Mrs. Kutcher eyes Ryan and then looks back at Ben. Jenny appears on the other side of the teacher's desk. It's true, Mrs. Kutcher. Ben promised he would go to the party, and when he said he couldn't because he had to do his report, Ryan was really disappointed. Mrs. Kutcher looks at all three of them and stares out the window for a moment, chewing on her bottom lip. Ben can't tell what she's thinking. Ryan, Jenny, please go sit down, she says. Okay, but, Ryan starts. Sit down, Ryan, Mrs. Kutcher repeats. Okay, okay, Ryan says. Mrs. Kutcher waits until Ryan and Jenny are in their seats and then looks back at Ben. You've known about this report for a long, long time. You've even shown me some of your notes. I know. Why didn't you finish it? I don't know. There must be a reason. You're so fascinated with the desert and you already know so much about it. I guess I've been doing other things and the desert just doesn't seem as interesting to me as I thought it was. Well, why didn't you say something? I don't know. I kept thinking that I would get the report done. Mrs. Kutcher is quiet for a moment, and then she says, If you could pick another ecosystem, what would it be? Ben is afraid to say I don't know again. He stares at his feet. I have an idea, the teacher says, and Ben looks up. He can tell by the tone of her voice is something new, something different. Why don't you write about a habitat around here? You're new to Massachusetts, and it might be interesting for you to find out about your new environment. Ben is astonished. Mrs. Kutcher knows more about him than he thought that she did. Could she have been talking to Mrs. Tibbetts? Like what, he asks. Well, what do you think? Wetlands, maybe? Swamps and ponds and marshes? Sounds good to me, she says and smiles. Okay, he'll have to start all over, but at least she's giving him a second chance. And since you've changed topics, why don't I give you a week? It's still a lot of work to do in that time. That's great, says Ben, and he can feel relief wash over him. All right, one week. That's it. And remember, I'll have to deduct points because you didn't turn it in on time. Okay, thanks. Ben rushes back to his desk before she can change her mind.
Jenny's looking at him with an eager gleam in her eyes. What happened? She's taking points off, but she's given me another week. I'm going to do my report on ponds and swamps here in Massachusetts. Benny holds up her hand for a high five.